welcome to our HHS Phase 2 OCR Protocol uh, webinar. I'm Carlos Leva, the CEO of Three Lions, publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide, and I'm also managing partner of the Digital Business Law Group. Along with me is uh, John Nelson, who's the technology Chief Technology Evangelist with Three Lions, and he's also a senior associate with the Digital Business Law Group, and of course, Martin Gwynn, our Director of Operations, is man in the chat, and we're going to just manage this uh, a little bit different in the sense that um, we don't have a set of slides that we're going to talk through. We're going to discuss how the audit protocol was developed by actually looking at the protocol, and then we're going to share some um, collateral, some approaches uh, using uh, the Survival Guide subscription plan to show how you can navigate. But the, the real value here is going to be in um, almost always, like in every webinar, is in the conversation generated by the questions that you ask. So unfortunately, HHS did not make the Phase 2 protocol easily downloadable. So this document that we're going to send to you after the webinar is one that I created. It's really, you know, I just cut and pasted it into this Word document. And as far as I know, it doesn't exist. It, it, HHS had some sort of promise that we're going to create some downloadable something or other, and they haven't done it. Now, and those of you that remember Phase 1, they actually had this pretty slick uh, online database where you could click on a security rule and then you would get all the security rule audit protocol and you could click on privacy rule and get all that. Now they put it into this one long thing and you really can't even search it all that all that well. Um, Martin, just by a show of hands, how many people have actually looked at the phase two audit protocol? Can, you, can we do that? How do they raise their hands? Uh, they, they raise their hands, and I will tell you in a moment. Okay, well, we're going to continue. A very, small, a very small number. Okay, all right, and that's what I would have expected, all right? That's what I would, I would have expected. Now, just a little background. Um, in the first protocol and the second protocol, what, what uh, HHS had really exploded is the kind of stuff they're asking you for at the granularity level of a requirement and sometimes at the granularity level of like a sub requirement okay now there's really nothing mystical about the audit protocol all HHS did as you can see is they got a bunch of they, they, they copied sections out of the privacy rule right because the privacy rules is CFR 164 500 series and then they give you a little title of what A5I is, and then they give you um, the actual language here. I think this language is probably verbatim from the statute. And then they tell you, okay, for this particular uh, requirement, this 164.502.A5I, this is what we're going to be asking you for, okay? Now, this is no surprise to us because when we created our security rule checklist, when we created our privacy rule checklist, we broke it down requirement by requirement because, you know, that's the only way you can comply, right? And some of you, if, you know, if you, first of all, let me back up a little bit. We're going to start calling these webinars the HIPAA Cut the Crap webinars, all right? And we're going to rename our newsletter the HIPAA Cut the crap newsletter because there's a lot of snake oil being sold out there uh, as you know as stuff that can help you be HIPAA compliant and it really it's really not anything that can help you be HIPAA compliant right so now almost seven or eight years on from the High Tech Act we're going to be de demystifying this and part of it is if you're not complying for every single rule and actually this applies to other compliance regimes if you're not complying at the granularity at the granularity level of a requirement, then you're not in compliance. Period. Right? And if, if you were to give me or my staff 15 minutes of your time, we could show you with our scorecards in 15 minutes or less just how far 
far you are out of compliance, even though you may have bought some vendor's tools or this or that, or you think the EHR vendor is taking care of, we could show you within 15 minutes just what you're missing, okay? Because, because most vendors haven't attacked it at the granularity level of requirement and therefore can't possibly, by definition, be helping you comply, okay? And so compliance starts with an understanding of what the requirements are, right? I mean, that's sort of common sense. Otherwise, what are you complying with, okay? And when we say our checklist, for every requirement, now we aggregate them a little bit different, okay? But we, we aggregate them a little bit different because sometimes it doesn't make sense the way uh, HHS has kind of parsed them out like this. But the requirements are what the requirements are. They, don't, they haven't changed since the omnibus rule in 2013. So we broke, we, 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 we cover all the requirements, and for each requirement, we have a, a reference back, a description of this checklist item, Right, and then we have the for a requirement. This is a, at the granularity level of requirement. We have the suggested policy for this requirement. We have suggested processes that you need to implement that underpin your policy. Okay, because your policy is just what you intend to do. Right, it's your intentions. It's, it's feel good language. Unless you have some processes that underpin your policy, right, you haven't done anything, and. Then, Unless you're capturing process results, you can't show visible demonstrable evidence of compliance. So what do you need per requirement? You need policies, processes, and the ability to track process results. Okay, so let me give you an example from the privacy rule. Privacy rule says you've got to train your staff. Okay, and then if I were an auditor, I would ask you, okay, Mr. Smith, tell me what your policy is regarding training your staff in HIPAA. And Mr. Smith, Smith might say, well, you know, um, we have this video training we, we bought from the company and people listen to the video and then they take this test and, you know, if they get a 70% pass, you know, then, then, uh, then, then we, we, we think they're good. Otherwise, they have to retake the test, right? So, what I'm looking for as an auditor is, okay, if you tell me about your policy, then I'm going to say, what are your processes? Tell me about your processes. Well, Mr. Smith just told me, right? It's like, you know, but another answer could be we do classroom training, uh, you know, it, whenever the law changes in a major way. For all new employees, we do this video training, and here's how we track it. We make them take the test and put it in their personnel file, right? So if you don't have all three, Okay, you, Mr. Smith just told me he's got a policy, he's got processes that underpin it, and he's got a way to track process results. Okay, so for the most part, I'm thinking, okay, Mr. Smith is, you know, I mean, this organization is, uh, as far as training, you know, not bad. And then I would say, well, do they, what do you train them on? Do you just train them on the privacy rule? Do you train them on uh, the security rule? Do you train them on breach notification? Do you train them on social media? You know what I mean? So, I mean, you just go down as, as, as deep as you'd like for that one requirement. But for every requirement, then you need to be able to respond with those three things, okay? And if you can do that, you, you not only demonstrate that you, you are compliant with this requirement, you kind of begin demonstrating that you have a culture of compliance, that you understand the requirements at the appropriate granularity level, and you've got some sort of methodology in place that allows you to track requirement by requirement, okay? Now, if many of, any, any of you and many of you have uh, vendors that have sold you HIPAA stuff, if they can't show you how they're covering each and every requirement, then I suggest to you that you, you guys come look at our, take a look at Espresso and take a look at our subscription plan and stop throwing good money after bad because if you're not complying at this level, then you're not compliant. So let me give you an example. This is what um, OCR wants to ask you for this A5I. Does the health plan use user disclosed for underwriting purposes, genetic information as defined, blah, 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 blah. Inquire of management, obtain a review, all underwriting policies and procedures, for example, published and unpublished underwriting guidelines, blah, 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 blah. blah. Evaluate where the underwriting, so this is for a health plan, right? So for everybody else, if you're a business associate, 
this wouldn't apply. So let's just scroll down and see this is still articulating established performance criteria and they're just taking this right out of the regulations. See the definitions or referring back to the definitions in, in 160. Okay, and then this next requirement. Uh, this one's a good one. Personal representatives, 164.502G. Now, if you're familiar with the privacy rule at all, you know that 502 is kind of the general place where you start. And let me see if we, we skipped anything here. And, um, if I can put the policy process and tracking mechanism into different words, I think it's fair to characterize it as uh, have a plan, execute the plan, and be able to demonstrate that you've executed the plan. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, that's correct. Well, yeah, provide evidence that you've executed the plan. Where's the evidence? You can't just tell me, yeah, we trained everybody. That's not going to be sufficient. I want to know, show me the database that, that, that has all the training and the results, et cetera, et cetera, right? So here, deceased individuals, there's a, there's a part of 502 that deals with deceased individuals and then do the covered entities, policies, and procedures protect the de deceased individuals' PHI consistent with the established performance, inquire management, obtain and review policies and procedures regarding use of blah, 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 okay? Now, so see, they're asking for, they're asking for policies and procedures at this level. At, 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 at not at the 502 level. This is this is at 502 F. Okay. Now what we do in in our uh, privacy rule checklist that I will show you shortly is we consolidate some of these and 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 so we capture them sort of in, in, in a more broad fashion. But here is the thing, and I'm going to tell you this: even though three lines is not um, cannot give right, uh, legal advice, because Three Lions is not a law firm, Digital Business Law Group can give legal advice because we're lawyers, okay? And so when I look at this from my lawyer hat, there are no, there are no requirements for a perfect documentation. There are no requirements for a perfect risk assessment. There, perfection is not the objective, right? The objective is, have you done something that's reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, Etc. 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 Right. That comes out of the that comes out of the security rule. It's called the flexibility principle, but it also applies to the privacy rule. Okay. But unless you're getting down and dirty to this level, then you're not complying. Okay. So, 562G personal representatives. This one is really complex because determining who's a personal representative is a question of state law, not federal law. So I would ask just a show of hands, how many people have uh, a, a, dec a decision tree prepared by their counsel that shows them whether or not they should accept a person's credentials as, uh, when they say they're a legal representative of the patient and therefore your organization should share PHI with them? Because that's what's at stake here. Personal representatives you know, can have the PHI of the patient, the patient may be a minor, the patient may be incapacitated, you know, et cetera, et cetera, okay? For every state that you operate in, you know, this comes up often enough that you don't want to be calling your counsel every time. So you should have a decision tree for your state law that kind of walks you through the kind of thing that you get. Okay, well, what happens if you didn't get it perfectly right? Well. Yeah, maybe there's a maybe there's a small breach here. You know, you might you might have to you might have to uh, uh, re report that if somebody sort of gained the system. But if you had a process in place and you followed the process, then yes, you probably would be dinged, right? Because you kind of got it wrong a little bit here. But you know, it wouldn't be it wouldn't it wouldn't probably would not be willful neglect. You just people make mistakes. The law doesn't require. Uh, the impossible of you getting it right every single time. This is a complex, determining whether or not somebody's a personal representative is a complex state law issue, and so lay people um, understandably sometimes get it wrong, but look at what they're asking for, okay? So again, this is like a sub-requirement. Do the policies and procedures provide for the treatment of an authorized person as a, uh, as a, a personal representative? Inquire of management. Notice that Management's on the hook. They don't say inquire of 
the privacy officer, inquire of the security officer, it's management that's going to be on the hook. How the entity recognizes personal representatives or an individual for compliance with the HIPAA rule, blah, blah, blah. Well, I just suggested how you ought to do it. You ought to have a decision tree prepared by your counsel that is for the state that you live in. So for us, it would be Florida. And you kind of walk through that, and you ask the individual to provide certain authentication. And, and so that guides you into determining whether or not this individual is, in fact, a for a personal representative, then it says obtain and review policies and procedures for the recognition and treatment of a personal representative. Well, that's what we're talking about. The decision tree would be part of your policy and, and processes regarding how you go about determining that. Whether the policies and procedures are consistent with the established performance criteria. For example, do the policies and procedures address how the covered entity determines whether a person has authority to act on behalf of the individual? I mean, it seems like how do the policies and procedures address minors? The deceased obtain. It seems like it's you know what I mean. They're it's like overkill here because they're like repeating themselves, right? They're 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 thoroughly redundant. But the point is, the point is they want to see stuff, some documentation, some process, some policy at this particular level of granularity. Now, okay. Uh, so let me. Let me we got just to interrupt to answer your original question, how many have a decision tree? The answer is zero. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I, and I actually, so, I've got a question right. myself. So the personal representative analysis is controlled by state law. So how consistent would you say that the states are um, amongst and between each other? Are they generally following the same framework? Are they all over the place? Or are there are some certain states that are just radically different in their approach uh, than the majority? You know, to be honest with you, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have to punt because I haven't, I haven't studied, you know what I mean? I haven't done that comparison as to, I, I would say that there, you know, I would say that there are many similarities just, you know, anecdotally, and, but I, the devil's in the details, right? So just saying there's similarities doesn't really help you, right? And so I don't think it would be like wise to come up with a decision tree for Florida and say, yeah, you can use this in every other state, right? Because oh, absolutely there, there, not. There's right. I mean, that's just you can't do it. So you got you got to do a decision tree in every state that you operate in, and and have counsel go look at that state law and say, are there are there any any differences? Otherwise, you just you just possibly committed a breach, right? You're giving PHI to the wrong person. That's a breach. So Martin, was there was there a question? Oh, you were just telling me how many people have a decision tree. That is correct. Okay. I have no questions at this time. Okay, right. So look how long this goes on about the, what they want you to produce for an audit, right? And that's a lot, right? So let me just get to the bottom of that. Evaluate whether the decision to not recognize a person as a personal representative was consistent with the established performance criteria and an entity has established policy and procedures. Evaluate whether the person has been treated consistent with the established, blah, blah, blah. This is, looks like they just repeated that, that sentence right there. Anyway. So let me do some show and tell because um, we haven't gotten, we, well, we, look, we've only looked at two requirements in the privacy rule. This, by the way, this document is 400 pages, 408 pages long, this audit protocol document, right? Now, part of that is obviously we're trying to, you know, the, their HHS is presenting a lot of text in narrow columns and so, and look at all this empty space, but that's just the nature of the beast because you know that was the only way that I could that I could get this. But let me let me show you um, a little bit about how we go about attacking that in the privacy rule. Okay, and so what I'm going to show you is part of our privacy rule checklist where we go through and for every um, requirement of the privacy rule we tell you, we give you the criteria, what you ought to be doing to ensure that you have visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. So I know that's, that, you know, some people have gotten, um, you know, a bad word about checklists, but I guarantee you not all checklists are created equal, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you um, what we do, right? We call we call checklist items, checklist items, a checklist item is equivalent to a requirement, 
in the privacy rule or a sub requirement. Okay, and we split the pri privacy rule into three segments, and this is useful because it helps you attack the privacy rule uh, and understand the privacy rule. So sections 164.502 through 514 that deals with permitted uses and disclosures. Okay, so if you're trying to figure out if someone violated the privacy rule, you would start with 164.502, and it turns out that 164.502 points you to all these other sections. But you're trying to figure out, did we mess up? Is the fact pattern that we got here, did we give it to the wrong person? You know, did we fax it to the wrong doctor? I mean, you're, you're trying to figure out what, what is an impermissible use and disclosure. Okay, because that's figuring that out, that's how you figure out if you violated the privacy rule. So if you don't have a methodology for determining how and when the privacy rule is violated, then how can you ever sanction anyone for violating the rule, A, and B, how can you ever determine that a breach was triggered? Because the first question in the analytical framework for breach notification is, whether there was an impermissible use or disclosure. They could have said, was there a violation of the privacy rule? Okay, so you have to have a methodology. They're going to ask you, where's your methodology for determining if the privacy rule uh, was violated? And so, and again, just I'm, I'm going to keep going here, but a show of hands on how many people in their organization can actually go pick up and read what our, what our methodology is for determining if the privacy rule was violated. Now you might think this is some esoteric thing that only a compliance officer does, but no, look, it's, the, it's your clinical staff that's on the front line that at least needs to be literate enough to know that, hey, they may have messed up, right? So that old feel-good training that you used to say, you used to say, oh, the clinical people, they don't need to know that much, right? That's all, that's all ancient history because after the High Tech Act, everybody's got to be more literate. Do they? Do your clinical staff have to know as much as your compliance officer? Well, no. Or, or your CEO? No. Right? That doesn't make common sense. But do they need to know more than they used to know? Absolutely. Because they're the ones on the front line committing the breaches potentially, right? So if you don't train them on the appropriate uses and disclosures, then how are they going to know what's permissible and, and what's not permissible? I have okay. an answer to your show of hands and also a quick question. The answer to the show of hands is one. Ah, oh, that's surprising. Okay. And, One out of 85. Woo, yeah. that's not a good percentage. And hey, what, tell me, tell me what, what's, what, what's the percentage? Bad. <laughs> You're going to put me on the spot here. Uh, I am, man. You can whip out your calculator. Okay, what else, Martin? Um, is this webinar only going to be focused on the privacy rule? Will the security rule be discussed as well? Oh, no, we're going to jump to the security rule. I'm just, just the introduction. The fun's just getting started. Okay. In particular, uh, what is this? The individual asked the question. What, what do they want to know about the security rule? Because yeah, I'm, I'm, we're going to go all. all over they the were way. not specific. They just wanted to know if okay. we were going to go. Yeah, given time, given time, we, we we're, 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 yeah, we're going to jump to the uh, security rule as well and take a look at some of those requirements. Okay, this is privacy rule uses and disclosures zero zero one violation of the rule. Okay, this is our first checklist item. Notice, I just want to stand down, notice there's a description, there's references back to the section 164.502, and if you click on this, it's going to take you to that place on the HIPAA Survival Guide. I don't want to do that because our, our um, shameless video plays for sales, uh, but I suppose I can go and back out. Let me see how quickly I can go there and back out of it. And the uh, answer there is 1.18%. That's uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I think my answer was good, bad. <laughs> it's not right. Okay, I didn't. I didn't get the. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, we got out of that. We're welcome. We're going back here. Um, so for a checklist item, here's what we said. And and so notice that we did something. This was a common sense thing. Okay, we didn't we didn't go down into the weeds of every single subsection of 502. 
Okay? And we, we sort of consolidated that because it was at some point becomes too complex to really deal effectively with. So when you when you purchase our product or really anybody else's product, what you're getting is curated content is you know, they, hopefully if they did it right, they're trying to help you not only understand what it is, but also practically deal with it, okay? So we, we, we just consolidated and said, okay, 164.502 is, is the general rule. That's where you got to go to determine if there's been a violation of the rule. And so this is our policy. It's our policy to adopt, maintain, fairly implement a methodology for determining when the rule has been violated. Our methodology will be based on industry best practices, blah, 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 blah. So you you see that a policy is really gobbledygook. It's you know flowery language saying what you intend to do. If you stop right there, you're willful neglect. This is not enough. It is our policy to fully document each each rule violation, allegation of saying to provide a rationale. Blah 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 blah. Right. Well, that means that you have some sort of methodology for determining that the privacy rule was violated. Otherwise, how are you gonna know? Right. And so for sanctioning people for breach notification, and then we give you. A process that you should implement. Each violation or alleged violation will be documented documented according to our documentation policy. Our compliance server is charged with conducting a thorough investigation of each violation on a yearly basis, blah, blah, blah. So now we're giving you practical information as to, okay, how do you deal with this requirement, right? The requirement in general is, was, was the privacy rule violated, right? And so instead of going to every nook and cranny like um, like HHS did in the protocol, we kind of said, you know what, that's too much detail. We're going to go to 164.502 and kind of say all that is a violation of the rule. Why? Because we're trying to, we're trying to, we're not trying to be academic here. We're trying to give you some tools that are comprehensive and at the same time that are practical right so that you can actually implement this thing in some reasonable amount of time and show so you could show right you could show if if, if um you know if hhs said how do you how do you uh deal with um you know section 164.502 determining if the privacy rule has been violated and you say well we, we, we have a methodology in place you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to get to the methodology real quick here, but I want to finish this checklist item. Notice all this, the policy statement, the reference, the description, the reference, the policy statement, the process, all these are related to 164.502, one requirement, okay? Then we give you tracking mechanisms. Violation documentation will be filed in each workforce member's personnel folder or the business associates electronic folder. Verification that our violations process is managed according to our policy will be accomplished by X. Workforce members determined to have violated the rule will be sanctioned. This is how we go about, you know, sanctioning people. This is our process when when there's an impermissible use, part of it, sanctioning, okay? Now, to figure out whether the, the privacy rule has been violated, we can go to our breach notification framework, okay? So I'm going to back up here, and I'm going to go to breach notification rule. And I want to bring up breach notification framework. Well, this is one and of my uh, favorite ones because often, uh, how do you determine whether a breach has occurred? Has got to be one of the most common questions, and and it's often treated as though um, you're reading tea leaves, but um, but it's exactly. but it's really not. You know, it, there there are uh, certain. Uh, steps. Uh, essentially, there's an algorithm uh, that you can follow in order to determine that. It doesn't have to be guesswork. Right, and we're going to cover that really quick, too, But uh, uh, the algorithm. But I'm, what I want to go is to um, here. This, this, was there an, imper was there an impl uh, impermissible use in uh, Martin when it, my, my headphones saying it's battery low, so I may have to jump to the computer mic here in a second, okay? Okay. So, so um, was there an impermissible user disclosure of unsecured PHI? This is part of the framework that John is talking about. This, imperm this impermissible use, this is the analytical framework for determining when breach notification was triggered. Impermissible, impermissible use really 
is saying, in other words, was the privacy rule violated, right? So that's where your methodology comes in. It's like if you don't know how you determine when the privacy rule has been violated, how can you ever determine whether or not there was a breach? You can't, okay? And so I'm going to show you, if you had our subscription, what the methodology would be for determining um, that the privacy rule has been violated, okay? Now let's move on to discussion of impermissible use or disclosure. So now we're talking about here, okay? Now at the highest level, 100,000 feet, this is what you're asking for a given incident, okay? You, you, somebody reported an incident, you're doing the privacy rule analysis, and you're trying to determine, you know it was a system associated with PHI was in there, and the question is, okay, we know there was an attempt, was the privacy rule violated? If no, then there's no breach by definition and you're done, okay? Now, you know, at this at 100,000 feet, this is useless, right? Because we're just back to answering the question, doesn't help us. We need a more detailed way, and this doesn't help us. Was there a permissible use or disclosure? That's just stating the same uh, question over again, okay? So you need a methodology that is actually going to um, walk you through the privacy rule, okay? And here, here it is in a nutshell, right? The, the verbiage talks about it, okay? You know, but you start at 164.502, and you start and you go down the general rule and you keep saying, hey, was the PHI disclosed to the patient? If yes, that's okay because the patient can see uh, PHI. Was there a valid authorization? Yes, okay, we're good. Was it disclosed to a uh, legal representative? Yep, we're good, right? You're done. Was it disclosed confidentially? Yep, you're still good, right? If you get to the bottom of this, of that analysis that is 164.502, that's either going to tell you, yes, there was uh, an impermissible use or disclosure, or no, there was not an impermissible use or disclosure, okay? And so I'm going to show you what that looks like, 164. This is it right here, 164.502. I'll click here and go to the, so we can have more fun, the standard. Okay, a covered entity or business associated may not use or disclose protected health information except as permitted or required by this subpart, blah, 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 right? And then it says permitted uses and disclosures. So you would go down, and this is what we were looking at. Was it disclosed to the individual? Was it disclosed for treatment, payment, and operations? Was it an incident to or use of disclosure otherwise permitted, blah, 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 except for the uses. And, you know, you're walking down here and you're saying, hey, was it one of these cases? If it was one of these cases, it it's okay, and there's instances where you have to you have to disclose. So a covered entity is required to disclose protected PHI to an individual requested and required, and to the secretary, blah blah blah, and you know, and so forth. And so, pro, you know, then we're still look, we're still within we're still within 164.502. I'm gonna t I'm gonna go to the computer, and I'm gonna take off the mic, guys, to, and uh, Martin. Can you hear me? Uh, You're a bit faint. Can you hear me? Faintly, yes. yes. I'm going to get closer to the computer. Can you hear yeah. me better now? Yes. Okay, all right. So look at, we're still within 164.502. Hey, uh, Carlos, can you get any uh, closer to the mic? All right. Seems like you jumped down a well. I'm about as close as I can get, man, without not being able to read. I apologize. Um, okay, that's that's better. Okay. Um, so pro prohibited uses in disclosure, you're going to walk down and, and say, you know, did we dis did we disclose um, some genetic information for underwriting process? Did we sell the PHI? Did we do this other bad stuff? Okay, and now, look, you're still within 164.502, but 502 is un unlocking the keys to the kingdom. How you determine whether or not a privacy rule was violated is you start in 502 and you go ask all these questions, okay? And depending on this analysis, 
you're going to say, yes, it was violated or no. And part of that analysis is, were you faithful to the minimum necessary, right? If, you, if somebody needed some PHI, for example, another doctor, and you gave them everything in the world except the little piece that, that they needed, you know, then you, didn't, you, you weren't consistent with the minimum necessary uh, principle. Why are you giving everything when they just asked for this extra, okay? Uh, and then some exceptions where minimum necessary doesn't apply. And notice, it just keeps going on and on. Was it de-identified? If you shared it with a, a partner who's doing some research, did you de-identify it correctly? Now, without, without, um, without duplicating the entirety of 502, which would be a useless exercise, we've given you a framework in our recent notification framework, we're giving you a way to go about determining whether or not it was violated. You walk through Section 502, and obviously there's going to be some forks, and you can, you know, I mean, you don't have to walk through every section, because the facts before you for this particular incident are only going to require you to go down certain forks, okay? But the forks you go down are all contained, every single one of them, in 164.502. Because it points to these other sections that you have to look at. Okay? And any part of it, let me stop there. i got to get closer. Is there, any, is there any, um, any questions at this point? No, there's an observation about the mic is going out pretty bad. Other than that, no. Okay, well, what, what about now? It, it appears on my end to be better now. If uh, anybody can let Just me know, better, better, yes, hey, getting better, 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 better. All right, let's do this. Uh, JP, you, you uh, hold the fort down. I got a backup. I, I just need to go get it. All right, so hold the fort down. <laughs> okay. So, oh, uh, so it's hard to do that without uh, control of the uh, visuals here. Um, I can change the presenter and you can tap dance. <laughs> okay. Let's see what I can pull up here. This is what live television used to be like for all of those out, out there who can remember it. Things sometimes just go bad. Everything today is perfect. So would you like to be the presenter yet, John? I'm in the process. I'm trying to pull up these um, this other framework here because it's let's see my preparation. All right, there we go. Just unzipping this file. Okay, you prepared? Okay, all right, so I've got uh, some top 10 questions. We are kind of uh, changing, uh, changing gears here, but ah, thank you, I see that. You now have the screen. Okay. All right. So, top ten questions. I understand this. Uh, we're starting at uh, eleven here, curiously, but um, I think these these are pretty important in their own right. So, uh, what are the processes that you uh, that you perform to do uh, due diligence on your business associates? And now, this will also be one of uh, the questions that you'll be asked in in an audit. And of course, uh, you need your business associate agreement, but your or your BAA. But your BAA is is actually pretty analogous to your policies. So it's it's what your intentions are, um, what your uh, business associates' intentions are, and that's all well and good. You you need to have coverage there to ensure that they are complying. But uh, it does go further than that. So you need to be able to have reasonable uh, reasonable access. Uh, to do some verification, to do some follow-up, to see that the terms that you have in your BAAs were actually being followed. And 
so it, it is a sort of a, a two-step dance in, in that respect. So uh, okay, if you can, you hear can you hear me? A uh, little bit. Let, let, oh. let, okay, uh, why don't we follow up on this, John, a little bit. One of the things that always gets me about a BAA is the, the covered entity has the right to ask for a risk assessment from the BAA, and, and many times they don't. Okay, can you hear me now? That's true. That's true. Now you don't know. You don't need to be able to um, uh, have twenty four seven access uh, and and um, uh, go go with that deep down the hole because that would be too burdensome. Once again, you're not required to be perfect. You're not required to do the impossible. And and frankly, your BAA, uh, sorry, your BA would um, would not be too happy with that themselves. Uh, I mean, yes, you have a business relationship, you have a working relationship, but um, that that level of control can actually backfire um, both in the business reality of the situation as well as create, potentially create some agency issues. Uh, so I'm if they I'm have... Uh, can you guys hear me? Can you guys yes. hear me? Okay. Uh, go ahead and finish your sentence. We're just finishing this. Yeah. Right, right. So uh, I was actually just wrapping up there. You can uh, you can create some issues down the road if you actually want to exert too much control, and it's just not required. So. Well, let me let me let me jump in though. I just want to make sure people understand what Martin said that you have a right to ask for, you know, blah blah blah. Well, yes, you do if you put it if you put it in your business associate contract. Okay, there's certain statutory language that has to be in the contract. But the the statutory damages says damages statutory language doesn't say a VA a covered entity has the right to X. They just leave that wide open. Now in our standard contract, we put in yes that the that that the and that's where Martin's coming from because he's talking about our our stand, our contract that that we sell as part of the subscription plan says that a covered entity has the right to ask for policies procedures you know, a latest risk assessment, yada, yada, because it's not enough just to sign that contract, right? If a breach happens, somebody's going to ask, how did you, what did you do, Mr. Smith, to get satisfactory assurances from this BA? And Mr. Smith says, I signed the BA contract, and that's it. Well, Mr. Smith is toast, right, because you absolutely did nothing to get satisfactory assurances, okay? So if all you got is BA agreements out there, you, 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 you're really, really exposed if you haven't done more, but where you have the right, where Martin talks about the right, it's not a statutory right, it's a contractual right that, that you better build into your contract otherwise you don't have it, okay? And I can't see how somebody would leave it out because how are you going to do the due diligence that's necessary, okay? I mean, I suppose you could go to the BAs, camp out at their business and review policies and procedures, but, you know, that's not practical nor likely that you're doing that kind of stuff. So. Um, do I have the screen back? Martin? You will in just a moment. Um, do there you go? Okay. So what I wanted to wrap up here with is we give you a way, a process, a you know, a framework for going about and and figuring out, um, you know was there a violation of the rule? And here we're continuing with more flow charts. This is 164.522. Was there, were the identifiers removed? Can you re-identify and so forth? Uh, I think there's about 13 or 14 uh, charts that actually uh, deal with this. But here is a summary. 502 is a general rule. This is always the section your starting point for scenario, blah, blah, blah. Okay, let me walk through a couple more important things because this is the breach notification framework. Here, and then you get to assuming that an impermissible user disclosure was found, the next question to be asked is whether or not an exception applies, okay? So you've gone through this analysis, and there's two things you're trying to determine. Was there an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured PHI? Now, we didn't cover the unsecured PHI, we just jumped over that, but if you've encrypted according to the uh, uh, Secretary's protocol, okay, for data at rest, data in motion, et cetera, then, then you then you get to have the breach notification safe harbor. There can't be a definite. It can't be a breach by definition because you've managed to encrypt your EPHI in a, in a matter that makes it unreadable, unusable, or indecipherable. Okay, and so 
That was all part of question one. You don't get to question two. If there's no impermissible user disclosure, which means no violation of the privacy rule, you're good. You stop. Fill, fill out the incident document, and you're good. If it was encrypted at the right level, you stop. You're good. Fill out the incident document. Show of hands, and we're going to continue. How many people have incident documents and understand what, the, what they should put in each incident? Because you fill out the incident document even if it wasn't a breach, okay? Because an incident is an attempted breach or a real breach. An incident is just something that happened that caused you to investigate. And so, you know, here's the first question that I have, right? If, you, if, you're, if you're a small organization especially, but even some large organizations, if you don't know who you should contact within your organization to report what you think was an incident, if, I, if I'm an auditor and I ask that question and I get that deer in the headlights look, I mean, you're toast from the very beginning because how can you possibly know if something was a breach if you're not tracking security incidents, right? So this layers of the envelope, I mean, of the onion just keep peeling. And yes, notice that we tried to abstract on purpose 502 to let you manage this monster in, in, a, in a reasonable way. But now you're, the second part of the analytical framework is does an exception apply? That's just... The definition of breach contains three exceptions, okay? And what you do here in this part of the analytical framework is you say, okay, does my fact pattern match one of these exceptions? If it matches one of these exceptions, then it's no breach by definition, okay? It's just no breach. Now, the hard part is, right, how closely, how rigorous was your analysis of your of your fact pattern, the stuff that happened to the exceptions. Okay, and let me see. Uh, no, that's probably going to take too long. Let, let me just interrupt for a second uh, to answer your question regarding uh, the incident log. The number of hands raised is zero. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I'm not surprised, actually. But zero, I am surprised with that, with that number. If you don't have an incident, an incident log and you're not tracking you're in really, really bad shape. So uh, here, okay, here's the three exceptions. This is in the definition of breach itself, okay? Now, we're not going to cover uh, all of them, right? Here it is in HHS breach definition. So if you had our breach notification framework, you could go read it in the source, from the source. But I'm going to read one. Um, and Martin, I, I don't get <laughs> And if we can, uh, I'm curious if we can have a show of hands of how many people are encrypting their data, either uh, at rest or in transit. Uh, how many people have taken those efforts? Okay, here's 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 one of the exceptions: any unintentional acquisition, access, or use of PHI by a workforce member or person acting under the authority of a covered entity or business associate if such acquisition, access, or use was made in good faith and within the scope of authority and does not result in further use or disclosure in a manner not permitted under this subpart. All they're saying is in a manner that doesn't violate the privacy rule, okay? So, I mean, you know, they, they, unfortunately these are regulations and people that write regulations write it in all this legal ease. So they, they, they could have said it doesn't violate you know, the privacy rule, but they said they don't violate subpart E, and you got to know that subpart E is a privacy rule, okay? But this is one of the exceptions. So if this happened, okay, so here's a scenario. A billing employee receives and opens an email containing PHI about a, ta a patient that a nurse mistakenly sent to the billing employee. The billing employee notices that he is not the intended recipient, alerts the no nurse to the misdirected email, and destroys it, okay? And a lot of these, a lot of these examples came right out of the omnibus rule. So that 500-page omnibus rule PDF, and, and let me just say quickly, the omnibus rule is not really a rule. The omnibus rule was final, near final rulemaking that resulted from the High Tech Act. So the omnibus rule modified the privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. It's not a rule in and of itself. Okay, it's just final rulemaking. Well, they had. HHS took the opportunity to sort of provide some guidance around, you know, this, these exceptions. Well, you know, how, to, how should you think about them? Well, you know, 
if you had this scenario, you know, you have a billion, you know, it's got sent to the wrong, it got sent to the wrong person, okay, the, the billing employee shouldn't have seen that uh, PHI for whatever reason, but, you know, it, A, it was unintentional, okay, the nurse didn't intend to send it to the wrong person, the nurse and the billing employee are both workforce members, right, they're both under the authority of a covered entity or business associate, and it was in good faith. The nurse wasn't trying to do anything malicious within the scope of authority. Yeah, the nurse has authority to send this information. She sent it to the wrong person, and it didn't result in any further use or disclosure. So, you know, the billing employee notified the nurse, destroyed it, no harm, no foul. This happens every day, all day, 365. If this was a breach, then, then you know what I mean? It, 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 OCR would be just... You know, they'd have to, you know, quadruple their staff. There's, so you, you, there are common sense fact patterns that these three exceptions apply to, and if your facts fall into that, with the help of counsel, you can determine whether or not an exception applies. And if an exception applies, complete the incident document and you're done, all right? Otherwise, now you've got to proceed to step three, trying to figure out if there's a low probability that PHI was compromised and, mo and then and the law presumes a breach, now you're really toast, right? They, if you get to that part, you're probably going to no trigger notification, right? That, I, that's what I would advise you. There would be, I can't hardly imagine, there are some, but I can't hardly imagine, you know, the fact pattern that you didn't satisfy one, you didn't satisfy two, low probability, you know, like for example, if a laptop with PHI got stolen and, and it was unsecured, I mean, that's not even close. <laughs> you know, you can't wish that it hasn't been compromised. You just, was there a low probability? Well, no, it's probably a high probability. An unsecured laptop with a lot of PHI. So, and the burden is on the business associate. Well, the burden ultimately is on the covered entity because it's always the covered entity that notifies. Okay, uh, and that's in a complete separate discussion. But, Martin, are there any... Any um, questions? Well, yeah. <clears throat> yes, we have one question, and to answer John's previous question to the audience, approximately 20% take advantage of the encryption safe harbor, John. That's excellent. That's excellent. That's, that's higher than I expected. It is higher than I expected as well. <clears throat> the, the question is, we had an employee give a third-party report to a school psychologist. The parents signed a release, but we did not create the evaluation, so it should have not it should not have been released. Is that considered an impermissible disclosure? We're going to get the copy back and, and obtain the assur assurance that no other copies were made. What other actions sh shall we take? The employee will be disciplined as well. No, no, in that scenario, and I don't know that I that the questioner had the opportunity to, you know, give me the entire fact. So, you know, it's it's fact intensive, right? The, the exact facts make make a difference. But you're you're describing to me a scenario where PHI was released to somebody, a school psychologist. A school psychologist works for the school or the state, is not under the authority of a covered entity. Certainly, right. And so we violate the exception that we read. You've now released PHI to a third party. That's a breach, period. If there's just one record, you know, whatever your process was, you, you, you didn't send, you sent it to somebody you shouldn't have, that's a breach of PHI. That You didn't send that to the psychologist. Now, if you sent it to the psychologist for uh, treatment, right, then that's a different story because there's a payment treatment and operations exception. But it sounds like here you just sent it to the wrong psychologist. And, you know, the, the, the now, is the psychologist uh, a covered entity? Mm. Maybe, right? Probably is because the psychologist, does, does the psychologist provide health services? Okay. So now there are other exceptions. You, you'd have to go read. I don't think it really fits the exception that we read. But you have to go read the other two exceptions and see if 
uh, you could make an argument that, yeah, okay, that, that psychologist is a covered entity, the psychologist destroyed it, and, you know, yes, we're going to sanction the employee, but we think otherwise we're good. So, you know, it's the great, always the legal answer is it depends. But it really is a fact-intensive, um, I'm scrolling down to the security rule, guys, so that's why I'm trying to find the start of the security rule because everybody wants to talk about the security rule. Now, is there something? Uh, there uh, are, and, something else came up. It is the school psychologist that is treating the individual. The school psychologist. A third party report to a school psychologist. Um, that, that does sound similar to me. Uh, the exception where you know you, you give the patient file to the wrong doc uh, or wrong nurse, or what have you, and and it, it's it's found out pretty immediately before you know they could even view it or or say they um, or there's a very low likelihood that they would have been able to. Uh, similar to if you give. Well, well wait, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused though. That, uh, <laughs> what, who's the third party here? It sounds like okay, the, the psychologist is the person providing treatment. Okay, then they're the first party. Who was we had, who was let me reread it. We had an employee give a third party report to a school psychologist. The parent had signed. And wait, 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 I don't. Uh, maybe, yeah, but I don't understand what the third party report is. I don't know what it is either. What, what does it mean? So okay, read it again. We had an employee give a third party report to a school psychologist. The parent had signed a release, but we did not create the evaluation, so it should have not been released. Is that considered? Okay, stop right there. Stop, okay. stop, stop right there. Stop right there. It sounds like the legal representative. It sounds like the le legal representative of the child gave authorization. I don't know what this organization means by an evaluation. Okay, I, I don't know what that means, but. Perhaps it was a perhaps it was a third party psychologist or if the parent gave author if the parent gave authorization if you have a valid authorization from from the legal representative and for a minor you know the parent would be the legal representative and if the parent authorized and that's what you mean by release the information to the psychologist then no it's not a breach it was authorized. That's one of the that's one of the things one of the questions was was the PHI was this authorized to be released? If it's authorized the patient can authorize you to release it to anybody the patient wants. All they gotta do is say, I want my PHI to be released to A B C you know, company or person or and as long as it's authorized, you have it in writing and signed, because the patient can do whatever they want with their PHI, you know, I mean within reason, right? So if that's what happened, I don't know what your evaluation, your that's the part that threw me. Your evaluation may be some internal process that you. No, I, I have an update on on that. The evaluation was completed by a psychiatric hospital. So yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm you know I, when we don't we don't have time to solve this, this yeah. right now, but that this is this is why it's not e this is why in this case. In this case, I wouldn't try. If, if, if you should go to counsel, right? You should go to counsel. You know, you know that you do have a legitimate. Let's take this opportunity. You've described to me a legitimate incident that needs analysis. That's what it needs. You need to walk through, for example, our entire breach notification framework to see if it was triggered. Was it an impermissible use or disclosure? Okay, you got to go find that out, right? Blah blah blah. If it is, you you continue. Does it meet? Does one of the exceptions play, right? You absolutely have to go through this with rigor. You can't just willy-nilly be guessing, right? Because HHS is going to say, well, how did you know? How did you determine, right, that it was a violation of the privacy rule? Okay? And if you can show that you have a methodology, right, and you've got it wrong, well, you still may be slapped on the wrist, but you're not going to be in willful neglect. It's not like you stuck your head in the sand. We, we, we're we human. We get things wrong from time to time. But you're going a long ways to show invisible demonstrable evidence in a culture of compliance because you have a rigorous process in place 
to try to figure it out, right? And in most cases, when you, if you have a nuanced issue like this, where it's really, really nuanced, then you ought to get counsel involved, right? You ought to get counsel involved. So let me ask this. Who, somebody said early on, I know it was really early, it's like at 2 o'clock, somebody said they wanted to talk about the security rule. Is, is the security rule is a monster. What, what about the security rule uh, do you want to talk about? Okay, let's do this. Let's find, this is the general, 164.306 is the general principles. This is the, the one where the flexibility principle is at play. Okay, and, you know, um, you, can, you can do what's reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, resources, you know, yada, yada, yada. See the flexibility approach. That's built, that's built into the security rule. To determine which security measures the entity implements, the covered entity or business associate should take into account the following factors, its size, complexity, its technical infrastructure. So getting back to an example of, for example, in the security rule, uh, how many people have a disaster recovery plan? Let's, let's see, show of hands. Disaster recovery plan that you've actually implemented, tested, everybody knows their role. How many people have that, right? Because that's, that's a requirement of the security rule right, but the nature of the plan and how much testing you've done could legitimately vary due to the size, complexity, and capabilities of your organization, okay, and so you could, what we encourage people is, you have a, we have a security rule checklist that goes through every single one of the security rule requirements, and it's just like the privacy rule, and so we've had clients say, well, what do you you know, where should we put this documentation? I'm like, well, put the documentation of what you've done right by the requirement, right? And and so if you have a disaster recovery plan that you can articulate in two pages worth of bullets, okay, then this is not a contest to see who's got the best disaster recovery plan. What is important is what you're actually doing to prevent the disaster from happening. Are you mirroring? You know, do you have backups going to two different sites? Are you using some cloud software vendor that is, you know, is capable of, you know, maintaining your data in some, you know, underground tunnel in Utah or something? Whatever, right? This describe what you've done. That for for a small to mid-sized organization, that's probably an, enough documentation for what you're doing. Obviously, if you're Kaiser Permanente or you know somebody large, then your disaster recovery plan is probably going to need to be more robust just because of the number of people, staff, blah, blah, blah that you have, okay? But this is what supposedly HHS put into the security rule to, let, to allow it to scale up and down from uh, small covered entities and business associates to large. Now, the reality no, is, is, go ahead. Uh, now, at, at any scale, the most important uh, part of a disaster recovery plan is that it's effective, that it actually works. If disaster happens, will it work? And, and to that extent, um, it doesn't matter how big or small your organization is. Now, the steps that you take may depend on the size of your organization, but at the end of the day, does it work? Exactly. It's the results that matter, not, not you know, the, not the, the uh, how thick your documentation is right so um, so you can if you, you can apply common sense here but you can only apply common sense once you know what you're doing right you can't apply there is no common sense if you're illiterate as to what the requirements are to start with go ahead Martin uh, back to the original question how many have a disaster recovery plan a little under 14 percent of the audience Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I would think that that would be much higher, um, but it's better than zero. All right. The security rule monster is in the administrative safeguards. That's the 164.308. Okay. And you, as most of you know, the security rule is split into standards and then implementation specifications. Okay. This standard security management process, the first standard of uh, the security rule, a covered entity or business associate must, in accordance with 306, which is the flexibility general principle, implement policies and procedures to prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations. Okay, 
That's the standard. And then there are implementation specifications. There's actually four of them. And they tend to dominate and swallow the rule. What are they? Well, the first one is a risk assessment. Let's see where they bring this up. OK, this is auditing query. This is what they're going to ask you about in the security rule. First, first standard, OK, the first and most important standard is the first one in the security rule under 308. OK, and we're in the administrative safeguards. Okay, so does the entity have written policies and procedures to, you know, by? So you have a policy, right? You know, that's the start. That's the starting point. Does the entity prevent, detect, contain, and correct security violations? Well, one, one. Um, if you're not monitoring, right? If you're not reporting incidents, then you know you probably can't produce any evidence here because you don't, you, you're not tracking anything. Obtain and review policies and procedures related to security violations. Evaluate content of obtain and review. Let's see. Um, Right. So that's at the highest level. Here's where the fun starts. See this A12A security process risk analysis. Now you're getting to the first implementation specification under the first standard of the administrative safeguards, and this is the first monster you encounter. Okay. Have you done a risk assessment? If you haven't done a risk assessment, you might as well forget the rest of the security rule because you're probably in willful neglect. Okay? And HHS recently um, recently issued some guidance about how you should go about doing it. And it really just sa it says follow. Essentially, it says our recommendation is that you follow the NIST special publication 800-30 Rev 1. Okay. Well, 800-30 Rev 1 um, is what we abstracted to produce Expresso. Okay, so I don't know how many of you know that we have a a product now. Not only do we have training, policies, procedures, we have a a software as a service product, Expresso, that will allow you to do a risk assessment in three hours or less, okay? And in the blast that we send you, because I'm going to distribute this, this protocol here, because it's, it, it's hard to find in this form, because I don't, I, no one gave it to me, right? So I was reduced into just uh, getting it and putting it in this format. You have to do a risk analysis, and you just, and it's not one and done. You probably, in the guidance that HHS just released, they're saying, oh, you know, one to three years, blah, 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 blah. It depends on, you know, your, your, your specific circumstances. I'm, you know, my just common sense guidance is you better be doing one at least once a year. And for most organizations, it's once a quarter. Why? Because the bad guys are getting smart every day and figuring out how to, how to penetrate your network. In fact, you can just assume now that your network is going to get penetrated. Whatever you know, a firewall you have, and you know, proxy servers you have, and all that stuff you have that that was trying to protect the perimeter, that that's gone. Okay, that, that's gone. So serious security professionals now understand. You know what? Forget that. The perimeter can't be protected. The question is, what are you going to do after that? Okay. Well, but that the doesn't. Line, um, go ahead. Just, go ahead. just as a caveat, that doesn't mean that you should abandon um, those procedures. Uh, you know, firewalls and, and VPNs, and every every one of the controls that you have in place to secure your perimeter. It doesn't mean to abandon them. Just to understand that you're probably already compromised in some way, and and to keep that in mind, so you can address these problems and go after things in addition to your perimeter controls, like yeah. trying to reduce your dwell time and things of that matter. Um, exactly. It's, uh, it's, 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 it, it, go ahead, go ahead, Martin. Go ahead. I, I would like to ask a question, since we've asked a question of the audience for almost everything else. I would like to know by a show of hands how many have done a risk assessment. Back to you. Okay, so is um, Martin is telling that you know, and here's the thing. Here's where there's a lot of stink oil. Okay, I'm not going to name names here, but if you think you've done a risk assessment because you took some soft, some questionnaire or some survey, and some vendor said that that is sufficient uh, 
to be a risk assessment, then you're in deep, deep trouble. Okay? It would be because in the guidance that was just recently issued, and uh, Martin, as a service to our uh, subscribers here, when we send him, when we send them the protocol, we'll send them the recent guidance as well from HHS. Okay. okay. HHS is telling you you have to match threats, vulnerabilities, calculate risk. All they're telling you is use 800 SP, SP 800-30 Rev 1. And sure, they they qualify that, that and say, well, you know, we're we're really we're suggesting here's a great methodology to use because all government agencies have to use it so you know the government likes it but they say well you know you're free to use some other methodology but what they're really saying is you're free to use some methodology that is as good as this or better all right so and if essentially you, at your own risk because we know that own. we know that this works you know exactly we, we know that this works we'll accept this methodology you're on your own if you know if you think you can use a questionnaire um, and you've had a significant breach, and, and you know um, HHS OCR comes calling, and you and you say you use this as a defense. Well, my HIPAA vendor said that this was a risk assessment. You know that ain't going to help you. You're, that ain't going to help you. Your 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 HIPAA vendor is not the one that's on the hook. They don't have to. Well, they may have to comply. They're a business associate, but they may not be a business associate, right? I mean, we're not a business associate for for our subscription plan because we don't use PHI. We just give you a bunch of tools that help you deal with the rules. Okay? That's not going to be any defense, right? It, it, because you didn't conduct a valid risk assessment. The valid risk assessment has certain terms of art, rigor, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Now, we've encapsulated all that into Espresso where we believe that you le legally, in good faith, can create a um, risk assessment in three hours or less. Now, how can we do that, right? Because that sounds like BS and magic. Because we pre-populate Expresso with 150 risks. We go. We don't leave you with a blank sheet of paper and say, "Here, fill fill it in. Good luck." Right? It takes three months to, to import all your security objects. We pre-populate Expresso with 150 risks, and not only do we do that, we associate all the security rule controls all 29 of them with those risks. So if you implement every control that Expresso has already pre-populated for you, now we didn't get these out of thin air, they're right out of the security rule. We took all the required controls, all the addressable controls, and we linked them up, okay? And if you go through that process, not only are you going to create a risk assessment report in three hours or less, your level of literacy and this is the most important thing, right? That your level of literacy of how actually cybersecurity works and what is like cybersecurity 101 is going to go from, it could go from 0 to 60 or 80 really, really quick because Espresso has extracted a lot of the complexity out of it, okay? And you don't have to have all your security objects. And what's a security object? Well, phones, pads, servers, you know, any kind of sort of device, but it also includes your workforce, applications, databases, processes, right? A security object is something that a control can be applied to, all right? So that, that and that control is being applied to that security object to protect the EPHI or reduce the risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size, complexity, et cetera, okay? So this is in the first standard of the Ministry of Safeguards, and already, if you haven't conducted a, a valid risk assessment or you listen to some HIPAA vendor right, that sold you on, we have a survey here, and that's all you need to do, good luck, right? You're not, you're, you just can't sweep it under the rug. It's not the way it's going to fly, and I think HHS now has sort of run out of patience, and they're doing desk audits, and they can do plenty more now, right, because they can just... What a desk audit is, is, they just send you this audit requirement. They say for every one of these requirements, so maybe they pick a subset, right? For every one of these requirements, out of this 408-page PDF, give us this stuff. Give us the, the stuff that we're talking about. Okay. And, and, what um, but, and let's talk uh, a bit more about why the analysis step is so important, because you can't remediate anything if you don't know what you need to remediate. 
you need to analyze before you can act on that analysis. So, uh, and, and this is just, it's, uh, it's just the first step. So, and it's the first step that you'll, you'll be doing over and over. So, I mean, yeah, you can do a survey over and over. It might make you feel better for a little while. But if you do a legitimate risk assessment, uh, either using Expresso or using some, some other tool that, that you're comfortable with, if you do a legitimate risk assessment, you can always improve on that because it's a cyclical process. It's not a fire and forget process. And the reason why it's cyclical is because you're doing the other steps too. You analyze, you re remediate, and then you analyze how well your remediation is working, and that goes into your next analysis step. So it's it's evergreen, as we like to say. Right, and what John is talking about is it's captured in the next implementation specification of, remember, we're still in standard number one of administrative safeguards. And these two implementation specifications, the risk assessment and the next one, which is risk mitigation, your risk mitigation program, for all intents and purposes, they will swallow the entire rule. It's almost like 95% of the rule. If you get that right, you might avoid willful neglect even if you didn't put the rest of the things into play. Security management process. Okay, this is the next implementation specification, all right, and it's called risk management. And essentially, this is your entire program, right? You have to have, you have to, and this is where John says it's cyclical, and I don't understand exactly why, um, other than to emphasize why um, the writers of the regulations kind of split out the analysis step because the first step in your risk management process is to assess. What does that mean? Do a risk assessment. Okay, do a risk assessment. That's always your starting point. Well, the next point is simplify. Let's say you've done the you've done the espresso baseline uh, risk assessment, and you say, you know what, we only have enough budget to attack the first twenty of these risks during this iteration. So you're going to have to make some business decisions as you know how much budget do you have. Right? This is not a one one and done deal. So you you assess, you simplify, then you protect. What does protect mean? Actually implement the controls that you identified in the analysis step. What does that mean? Well, if in the analysis step you, you recognize that you didn't have a disaster recovery plan, well then in the remediation step, you better implement a disaster recovery plan, right? That's the control. And in fact, Every one of the implementation specifications in the security rule, in and of itself, they're really controls. And HHS, now security controls, they are, they are the things that are allowing you, according to, the, according to HHS, according to the rule, that are allowing you to reduce risks to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. The way you go about doing that is implementing these controls. Okay? And it turns out there's about 29 of them. So that's the good news. There's not 2,000 in the security rule. There's 29 that you got, and and Espresso links all 29 to to subsets of the 150 risks that we've identified. Okay, and that's that's how you can get there so quick because of we've kind of rationalized SP 800-30. But let me continue here and show how. John is absolutely correct as to being cyclical. And this Can is I, a paraphrase. Go ahead. Uh, the point I wanted to make was in uh, the uh, audience participation in taking a risk assessment, less than 17% have performed a risk assessment. Right. And, you know, the question really is what, just because we know what is being sold out there, you know, and let me ask you this. Of that 17%, how many of them have done it using the NIST recommended process that's contained in SB 800-30, where you match threats, vulnerabilities, and then you decide what's the probability of this threat exploiting this vulnerability, and if that happened, what impact would it create to my mission? How many people have done a risk assessment using that model of the 17%? That's what I would be interested in, in, in figuring out because some of you I know uh, are buying products that are just pure snake oil because they're not helping you. They're not. You're not doing a risk assessment. You, you I, I, and I'm not bad mouthing the fact that a survey or a questionnaire or all that doesn't add any value. It does add value. It may help you. It's just not a risk assessment. 
Okay, so let me go through the steps here, though, of the second implementation specification. It's assess, simplify, protect, and then monitor. Monitor what? Monitor how well your controls are doing that you implemented. Report, right, because you got to report to somebody. You report to your executive team how well you're doing, and then what do you do next? You assess again, right? That's the cyclical recursive nature of your risk management program. And that's why we say these first two implementation specifications of the security rule almost swallow the entire rule, like 95%. This is your program right here in its entirety. And you better have one in place. You better be able to talk about, well, what's your methodology? What, you know, if I'm an auditor, this is the kind of question you can expect. Talk to me about your risk management methodology. How do you go, how do you go about reducing risk. If you can't answer that question and you start hemming and hawing, you know, you know, this is this this is what's required is to change how people think about compliance. Okay? And although HHS doesn't come out and tell you like per se, because they're never going to do that, they're kind of giving you these roadmaps that we want you to think about compliance in this particular way. And when it comes to a risk assessment, they tell you, we want you to think about it like NIST does, okay? That's good enough for all the government agencies saying, yeah, this is, you know, this is the guidance, right? That's why it's guidance. It's sort of telling you between the lines. Right? Any questions? Uh, the answer to your question was four. Have followed the guidance. Okay, right. That's right. Obtain and review documentation demonstrating the security measures implemented and on it. And okay, yeah. As a result of the risk analysis or assessment, evaluate and determine whether the implemented security measures appropriately respond to the threats and vulnerabilities identified in the risk analysis. Notice what they're using. Threats and vulnerabilities. They're using the language here of 800-30, right? And what is it? That, that's what they're going to ask you about, their audit inquiry, okay? So if you don't have an identified threat vulnerability pairs, you got that deer in the headlights because all you did was fill out a questionnaire, you know, you, you're probably toast, okay? And because the approach, the methodology matters, okay? And they're giving you hints here by telling you how they're going to ask the questions, right? Okay, Mr. Smith, tell me. What threats you identify? Well, if you're in Expresso, you can just open Expresso and show them. <laughs> you know, here are the threats. And how many do we have, John? We don't have a crazy number, right? Of threats? No, yeah. no. Uh, we've we've actually uh -huh. distilled it down into we've actually distilled it down into nine threats. So we have nine threats and 29 vulnerabilities and 29 controls. And the reason why there's the same number of vulnerabilities and controls is because they're actually mirrors of each other. They're, they're the inverse of each other. So let's, let's take, for example, one vulnerability is, is that you don't have a risk assessment methodology. So the control for that is to implement a risk assessment methodology. So it's sort of a matter-antimatter relationship where the control annihilates, or in this case, brings that vulnerability and um, you know covers that vulnerability. So the risks associated with that vulnerability are brought down to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. So let me let me let me play devil's advocate here, right? So you you know you're a knowledgeable compliance officer. And you know for a fact that in the wild, there are thousands, literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of threats, okay? And so you're thinking, well, well how can you possibly, like, reduce the number to nine, okay? Because when we looked at the problem, we understood that there, it was impossible task to deal with hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of threats out there. You, you never in your lifetime would you ever finish, okay? So what we did was we aggregated threats into categories. So, for example, we have social engineering or intrusion, okay? So really, what is, what is that saying? That is, that's encapsulating all 400,000 ways 
of how people can get into your network. Okay. Now we don't care. We don't care so much. We care at the end of the day. We don't care so much though about what vector they use to get penetrate your network. We 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 care more from a compliance perspective. What are you doing about it? Okay. Because everybody now assumes that somebody's going to get in, right? And how they got in may be something that's 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 of interest, right? Because it helps you later. But the fact that they got in either through some social engineering scheme where they trick somebody out of their user ID or password, or they just hacked your network. Okay? Then if they did true. that, but No, it's true that as a practical matter, uh, you do want to drill down into exactly how they got in, but for the purposes of your risk assessment, the point is that they got in. So true, as a practical matter, it, it matters because um, of the level of access that a malicious actor uh, could have obtained because not all vectors uh, would grant the same permissions and and abilities to exploit your your computer system or your processes in the same way but uh, for your compliance procedures the point is that they got in right and so we we we, we purposely curated the content curated the threats and vulnerabilities into something that you could deal with in a manageable way to conduct risk assessments effectively, okay? And you didn't have that blank sheet of paper problem. We had it. We had the blank sheet of paper and we said, you know, no, this is totally insane. Nobody can deal with 400,000 threats, right? And it turns out that really, you know, you, you, you don't have to. It, it, HHS itself in this says, yes, you can aggregate threats. Because that's what you do, because that's the only way you can manage it, okay? And so uh, the fact that we could aggregate threats that way and the fact that we understood that every security rule implementation specification was nothing more than a control, then we were able to say, okay, if, if, if the security rule says you need a disaster recovery plan and you don't have one, that's a vulnerability that can be exploded, exploited. If the security rule says you have you need to have a risk assessment process and methodology and you don't have one, that's a vulnerability that can be exploited. Okay? And so that matter, antimatter is the way that we were cover we were able to cover all 29 controls. Now, is that the universe of controls that you could implement? Absolutely not. You could probably implement, you know, hundreds of controls. But I'll tell you this, we did do a comparison and there is uh, I think it's the Cybersecurity International Association of something or other. I forget exactly what the name of the organization is. It's a CISC. Yeah, C I but what is what does the acronym stand for? Uh yeah, I'm I'm blanking on exactly uh what right. it stands for. Uh it's one but, Google search away if you're interested. No, but the point, my point is they have like this thing called the top twenty mission critical controls. Okay? They don't have the top four thousand, the top four hundred, they have the top twenty. Okay? It turns out in that top twenty there's a, a great deal of overlap between those controls and the controls that are in the security rule. Why? Because the security rule is like security management 101. Of course, we would expect that there would be overlaps, okay? So you're not likely to have hundreds and hundreds of controls. You know, you, 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 you may have certain controls that you actually fine tune and improve over time. Okay, the way you actually implement the control. Okay, are you effectively are you effectively um, managing malicious software? Okay, the fact is the security rule requires you to have some uh, something to manage malicious software. And okay, and so you get McAfee or you just say, okay, now we're using Microsoft and blah blah blah. But that particular control, you have to monitor it, and it's probably going to get better and better over time. Uh, it should from the vendor that usually the vendor that provided you if it's if it's a technical control not not all controls are technical though right training your staff is a control from the privacy rule that's a non technical control right in many ways your risk mitigation program that's not a technical control that's all process remember we're in the administrative safeguards now we've gone to three thirty one so we've been going now for about an hour and a half and I, you know, we could probably go on 
for longer if there were questions, but you know, this is what we wanted to introduce you to today is what do we mean by the granularity of a requirement? Well, look, look at this protocol. They've not only broke it down to you know a particular section, they're going down to subsections now and saying we're going to ask you questions about 164.308A1 to double I, little double I, C. Okay, and you know, part of part of this is just the naming convention. There's really not all these requirements and all these sublevels, but you get the idea. It's all the, the the protocol is all about requirements, all all about requirements, and it's entire. It's here. All of it is here. If right? you search for breach notification, uh, you'll find that here as well. Did we uh, we have any questions, Martin? Uh, not at this time. Um, we just have one note. Someone just said they love the way we have simplified the process on how to deal with this. So, kudos. That's to our guys. mission. That's really our mission. That's what we do. We 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 teach. We're teachers. I've been teaching now um, seven years every month, right? And, and helping uh, the marketplace rationalize. And if you like what you see. And come out and check out Espresso and check out uh, what you get for that $2,500. We believe uh, it's the most compelling value in the marketplace right now. Here's here's the breach uh, protocols, okay, for the breach notification rule, okay. And um, actually, that's interesting. They're they're actually starting with okay, yeah. The 400 series is really where the breach regulations start, they're actually including requirements for breach. Um, they're using some of the privacy rule. That's interesting. Training. Yeah, that makes sense. They're actually incorporating into their breach aud audit protocol. See, this is why you have to actually look at and, and get what they're doing here for breach. This isn't even the breach training set. I mean, this isn't 530 is the privacy rule requirement for training. Well, of course, if you're, if, you're, if you're going to prevent a breach due to social engineering, then how would you do that? Training. That's, you've got to teach your staff, don't, you know, don't reply to the, uh, Chinese guys that say they selected you out of the millions of people that they looked at because we got a contract that we want you to do, Mr. Layla. Right? I get two of those a day. Don't click on those, man. They're spam on the on, on their face. They're spam. Well, how do you know? Well, you got to train you. You got to train your staff. So this is you know this is HHS saying, hey, look, don't be so rigid here. Even though it's the breach section of the protocol, we're asking you questions about the privacy rule, just a different part of it. Ah, we're asking you more questions. How do you handle complaints? Again, in the breach section of the protocol. More sanctions. Are you sanctioning your employees? So now in the breach, not only is it covered under the privacy rule, now they're saying it's covered under, well, they probably don't ask you this in the audit protocol up in the privacy rule. They probably saved it for down here. Okay? Do you sanction? And if you're going to sanction, then you have to understand that what? You have to understand how do you determine that there's been a violation of the security rule? Otherwise, how are you going to sanction? How are you going to sanction consistently across employees? Right, you're probably inviting a uh, a, a lawsuit. Okay, now we're going to leave it here. This is not the last time we're going to explore the protocol, but um, just by a show of hands, you know, because we like to get feedback, and I, I know people get overwhelmed, and so sometimes we don't give very many questions. But just by a show of hands. How many people thought this exercise was of use to them? And like the uh, final Jeopardy music should be playing right about yeah. now. Yes. Do, 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 do. <laughs> All right, guys. You know we do, we do this. I'm putting it around uh, 52, 53%. I haven't okay, done everything. 
Um, there was a, a question, uh, two questions. One about NIST 30 and risk assessments. I think you were talking about 800-30. It is 800 S30, yes. That's what I thought. Okay, so that answers right. that question. Second question is, I would like a copy of the agenda and confirmation of attendance to su submit for CEUs. Please. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm not sure how we do that. I think what you do is you, you take, we're going to email you this document, okay, this phase two document. Uh, protocol document. We're going to email it to you, and we're also going to e email you HHS's recent guidance about risk assessments. I'd say take that email and you and use that as your um, attendance record of attendance. And always the question: Will we will there be a recording available and the slides? The slides will go out tomorrow. Uh, yes, the, the slides here is, are just the protocol. But yes, we're sending you the protocol. We, 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 we usually try to make it available before, and we had a technical difficulty, and we didn't, we, we didn't make it available, but uh, we're going to be sending you this document, and we're also going to send you the HHS guidance on risk assessments that just came out, and maybe some other, uh, uh, some other goodies um, in, in the same blast, and, and it's kind of, you know, close to the end of the day, so we'll, we'll get that out tomorrow in, uh, in the a.m., but... Uh, yeah, to answer your question, yes, we record these. Um, most of the time, though, what we do is we just make these recordings available to our subscribers. However, we do, on a random basis, pick from our library of recordings and make them available publicly. Uh, so this one will go in the rotation. I'm not sure exactly when you know you'll you'll hear it, but. Uh, obviously, if you're a subscriber, you get access to it right away, along with all the other recordings that we've done. We recently issued some recordings on how to, I mean, free public access uh, recordings uh, re about how to conduct uh, audits, how to respond to audits, essentially. I think we have, uh, hopefully everybody here is on our newsletter. If you're not on our newsletter, you need to join our newsletter because that's where you get notification that... Uh, that a particular recording is available. So if you're not, and if you're not on our newsletter, then get on our newsletter, and you actually get a free uh, breach notification training if you sign up for our newsletter. It's the actual product that we sell, and so to give you a taste of uh, uh, of what we do. Um, Martin, I'm 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 happy to answer more questions if there's okay. questions. Okay, we have one last question, but I don't think there's anything we can do with it at this late hour. I would like to delve more into the security rule around the technical safeguards, as there seems to be a lot of repetition, especially around encryption and audit controls. Yeah, you know what the the, the security rule when it gets to the the, when it gets to the technical safeguards, is really, it, it's almost like they're asking you to do the same thing in, that they ask you to do in the administrative safeguards. So if you're sort of like wondering what, you know, you're sort of confused, why did they do this? Yeah, it's just the way it is, you know what I mean? Because apparently in the administrative safeguards, they want you to think about this stuff. <laughs> and in the technical safeguards, they actually want you to implement it. You know, and it's really confusing because you're, you're like, hey, you're talking about the same stuff you talked about over here. Well, that's the distinction. You know what I mean? They administrative safeguards. They're mostly talking policies and procedure. Okay, so let me give you an example. Maybe maybe this helps you out. But I agree, it's totally confusing. So, you know, in administrative safeguards, they say, you know what, you need a policy to grant use of of, of EPHI. How you know? How do you do that? You know, does a supervisor uh, have to sign off. How do you how do you determine that only it's only granted on a need to know basis? In other words, what's your process? What's your methodology for granting access to EPHI and for terminating access, for that matter? Okay. And then in the technical safeguards, it'll say implement methods to grant access to you know blah blah blah, and almost like they're repeating the same thing, right? So you definitely have to have sort of a common sense approach. Uh, you know what we do. What we do, just you know, out of a shameless plug, is there are people that will buy our tool and love it because you know they get espresso, they get 15 training modules, they get the checklist, they get that all that for $2,500. But you know they still want some direction 
and some help getting up and, and running. And so my law firm recently created what we call HIPAA Jumpstart, where we do for a fixed fee, we give you 20 hours. Uh, it's $2,500. If you do the math, it's super competitive price for legal uh, uh, advice. But then we're acting as your lawyers. We can actually tell you, yes, we believe if you, you're doing X, Y, and Z, we believe that that is legally sufficient to meet the requirement. Now, only a lawyer can do that. A, tech, a technical consultant, a HIPAA technical consultant can say, you should do, it's recommended, the best practices are with respect to this requirement, but they can't say, because it would be unauthorized practice of law, we think that that is legally sufficient. And as you get into it, all the nuanced areas that you think about are those areas where you want a lawyer telling you, yes, this is good. If you, you did it this particular way, that's legally sufficient. And we've seen people come from uh, thinking, this monstrosity, the security rule, how on earth are we ever going to get through it and in, in a period of two weeks and 10 hours go to about 70 percent literacy, at, you know, um, literacy, their literacy of HIPAA and what they need to do improves 70 or 80 percent in a very, very short period of time because they have counsel right now navigating them through this stuff in, instead of, you know, doing a DYI. But we, we built the products to do a DIY, and we understand, too, that a lot of smaller entities just don't have the budget, you know. But, but if you compare that value proposition to uh, the other value propositions that, you know, we're going to start a marketing com campaign around there to compare because uh, we don't think you can get that value anywhere in the industry. So, Martin, if there's not any further questions, I know there's 49 people still out there. I think we'll close it uh, here. Uh, thanks for listening. We're going to distribute this document. We're going to distribute um, HHS guidance. And we might distribute a couple other goodies uh, when when you uh, get the blast from us tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon.